Kia ora koutou. No mai haere mai ki tēnei kōrero na, na Natalia Kānem. Um, it's really great to have Dr Natalia Kānem here today, as you would have seen, hopefully, by landing here today. Um, she's the UN Undersecretary General and the Executive Director of the UNFPA, or the UN Sector and Reproductive Health Development Agency. Um, and she's going to speak to us today without slides, which is a novelty for this, um, and it's going to be really great to hear your perspectives on this, especially 50 years since the founding of um, UNFPA. And welcome to the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Kia ora. Thank you very much, Maddie, and good afternoon, everyone. I greet you in peace. Peace is the founding purpose of the United Nations. It is also part of our fervent wish at UNFPA the United Nations Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency, for every woman, girl, person in the more than 150 countries where we serve around the world. This is my first visit to New Zealand. In the UN, we call these missions. And I've had a dual mission this time. One was to speak with the government of New Zealand and to bring a message of thanks for upholding human rights gender equality, and also helping UNFPA and other parts of the United Nations to succeed in our mandate, which I'll say more about. And the second part of my mission, and that's why I'm so delighted to be here at Otago University, was to engage with civil society, with the people of this beautiful country. And I'm very delighted to be here on the 50th anniversary of UNFPA, and on your 150th here in this illustrious place of learning indeed. And it's a particular pleasure for me as a pediatrician and former professor and researcher to be among you in an academic setting to speak about some of the urgent needs that I see in public health practice. And I'm really delighted to be here with my UNFPA international team. And that includes none other than Saida Shamim, who herself is a graduate of Otago, and she's one of the leaders of our uh, Pacific programming here in the region. It was nearly 75 years ago, next year, the United Nations will celebrate its 75th anniversary. And our charter, the United Nations Charter, which we all share, established three founding pillars for the UN. And the system addresses peace, and security, human rights, and development. In this era, sustainable development. So meaningful as we're here in a region where the heart of our mandate and our work is demonstrating effectiveness and results. These results are predicated on addressing issues around, in particular, women and girls' rights and choices in particular, young people's rights and choices. And we say across the whole spectrum of inclusivity. It was wonderful walking into the lobby, seeing the flags flying, attesting to all types of inclusiveness, including sexual diversities and certainly for disability inclusion. And we at UNFP are very conscious of the fact that this is something that we should do every day including during times of conflict and of natural disaster. So uh, we would like to congratulate and thank New Zealand for supporting the human rights of women and girls, people with disabilities, LGBTIQ, and the whole spectrum of sexual diversities under the Human Rights Action Plan, which you have under development, and also for the, the, the specific focus on the Pacific, which should not be a neglected area. And the sustainable development goals say, leave no one behind. So we've got to put teeth behind that and get serious about that as we think about change. Um, it's interesting to me, hailing from Panama as I do, which has a similar population of about 4 million, seafaring country, that New Zealand has emerged as one of the top 10 donors to the sexual and reproductive health and rights agenda, together with data 
good data, population data that UNHPA espouses. So we thank you for that. And I hope that we'll have an opportunity to talk about partnership in many, many divergent ways that are predicated on community leadership, women's leadership, country leadership. There's a lot of strength in this agenda, but let me say at the outset, there's also a lot of controversy and a need for dialogue. And this is what distinguishes the multilateral system in this day and age. You know, choice is about knowledge, right? If you are ignorant of how your body functions, how can we really expect you to make a good decision that may affect the rest of your life and career? It's about bodily integrity, having the power, the ability, the means to say yes, hopefully to conscious, pleasurable, decision, consensual uh, sex and sexuality, but certainly having the power to say no. And it's also about having the power and the means to make your own decisions about whether, when, with whom, if you plan to have children, how often. These are choices across the life cycle that have a knock-on effect on other choices or the absence thereof. And uh, as a health system, part of our duty, part of our anxiety is to make sure that if you are undergoing pregnancy and childbirth, that you survive, that in fact you thrive, that you're welcomed, um, and that the atmosphere is one in which you receive quality care once you reach a health facility. And this really is about the cycle of life, life or death. So that's been the focus of our work in the past 50 years of UNFPA, but especially since 25 years ago, which at the midpoint in 1994, something revolutionary happened in Cairo. Uh, some of my team, myself, we were younger professionals who actually attended a meeting where under discussion by all 179 governments was population and development and where the paradigm changed from population as numbers or targets to being about people. And the people that we're talking about are the women and girls who should be at the center of development. So in Cairo at the International Conference on Population and Development, ICPD, in 1994, 25 years ago, UNFPA led the world in very important dialogues that were agreed upon that informed choices about sexual and reproductive health was a matter of fundamental human rights and the foundation for thriving and just and healthy societies. This is part of the foundation that has led to the elucidation of the Sustainable Development Goals through the groundbreaking Cairo ICPD Program of Action. Governments agreed that the right to sexual and reproductive health is central to human well-being and that progress on advancing gender equality, eliminating violence against women, and ensuring women's ability to manage their fertility, all were part of a program of action so that communities, governments, civil society, the United Nations, everyone mobilized to expand choices. And I'm happy to say 25 years later, there's been miles of progress that we were able to deliver as a result of this type of multilateral discussion. Hundreds of millions of women gained the power to exercise their right to decide for themselves about their fertility. More women than ever before today are able to use modern contraceptives and very important of their choice. You know, it's not a one size fits all. There are different preferences, different uh, uh, choices. Another big milestone, and there have been many, is that death in childbirth has fallen dramatically by 40%, by 44% since that period. So this is the good news. I mean, you know, the cycle of life says the birth of the child should be celebrated. And in this regard, there is a lot to celebrate. In uh, 1994, Nafis Sadiq, who was one of my predecessors as the leaders of UNFPA, stated, quote, Population is not just about numbers, it is, it is about people. And behind every number is a person, a woman. 
we can recall, for example, uh, the work that New Zealand is supporting far from home. And in visiting a Rohingya camp, I'd just like to tell you briefly about a woman that we can call Harlai Dar. She suffered unspeakable trauma as she fled out of Myanmar and into Bangladesh, including being badly beaten by her husband along the way. She called upon a friend for help. This friend was a regular attendee at the UNFPA Women Friendly Space, which actually can be a simple tent or sometimes you can erect a temporary shelter, but it's a private space where women and girls can come and feel safe and talk to each other. So this other woman knew the danger signs. She also knew that her friend was pregnant and brought her to access sexual and reproductive health services in this Rohingya camp. These are stepping stones along the way to either saving a life or having someone in isolation who can be victimized. And at certain uh, moments we've actually seen, this can lead to a very unhappy result. And this is just you know, a brief vignette, one woman story among the thousands that are driving us forward. New Zealand stepped up to fund the sexual and reproductive health services, including social work counseling. The midwives who speak the local Rohingya language and were able to hold the hand of these ladies as they came across the border with unspeakable crimes of rape having been committed among them, and certainly for the justice system. We refer for legal services, and we work with other parts of the United Nations to ensure that due recourse is given to these women and girls during a really, really terrible, turbulent time. Apart from humanitarian uh, conflict and crisis, just in the baseline population in the developing world where we work across these 150 plus countries, there's still over 200 million women who for reasons of logistics, access, cost, cannot uh, avail themselves of contraceptives. For the State of World Population Report, which we presented on our 50th birthday, we had to title it Unfinished Business because so much has happened in the 25 years since Cairo ICPD, but there is still a lot left undone. So the unmet need for contraception is one of our three zeros. 200 million women who want to prevent pregnancy but cannot. And this is tied to pregnancy and childbirth. At UNFPA, we say may every pregnancy be wanted, may every childbirth be safe, and every young person's potential be fulfilled. Yet, and still more than 300,000 women die every year from complications of pregnancy and childbirth. And I am inaccurate in speaking to you about this because these are not women. Many of them are simply girls who were pregnant too young, married off too young, and did not have the understanding or the ability to say no too young. So in 2019, what is the leading cause of death among teenage girls worldwide? Complications of pregnancy and childbirth. This is something that we can do something about. And with your help and you know, our combined ingenuity, this is what the brick by brick, step by step plan is that UNFPA is putting in place to end preventable deaths. Now, Another thing that I found very stark in reviewing for this 50th anniversary is that 15 million teenage girls around the world have been forced into sex. And that's often by partners or relatives or so-called friends. But only one in a hundred seeks help. I leave that hanging there because we know that stigma, taboo, inability to describe even your own body these are things that prevent women and girls from being able to use that rights and choices, self-agency. One in three women subjected to violence over a lifetime, and sadly in this region, double that. And far worse if you are a disabled uh, woman or girl. So as we see um, these physical manifestations of violent behavior, 
there's also a mental, a social, a psychological, an emotional toll that we all suffer together because of women being subjected to violence and in particular, seeing rape increasingly used as a weapon of war. Violence against women and girls, whether in war or peace by a stranger or an intimate partner is probably the most widespread human rights violation in the world. And it's also perhaps the clearest manifestation of the pervasive gender and power imbalance across all societies. And this is part of the reason that it's underreported. Now, as we have public health practitioners in the house and uh, others of you who are pursuing that course, we're the first point of contact for many of these women and girls. And you are going to be on the front lines of the fight to end sexual and gender-based violence. And you can help us turn the tide for survivors. Very important to know that men and boys are part of the solution. And we actually welcome those of you who are working in faith-based communities to again, shed light, you know, draw open the curtain, as they say, on some of these issues that it's going to take a lot of dialogue to shift the mindset decisively. UNFPA works to end child marriage, and this is something that we discussed with parliamentarians here in New Zealand this morning. Globally, one out of every five girls marries or is in a union by the age of 18. In the least developed countries, that number doubles. So here you have 40% of girls being married before the age of 18 and everything that goes along with that. And some girls are married at 10, 11, 12, you know, 15 years old, 33,000 every single day. We also uh, phrase this as a form of gender-based violence. You're a girl, you should be in school, you should not be walking down the aisle, and you certainly should not be oppressed into a marriage, not of your full consent and choosing. Similarly, over 200 million women and girls alive today have been subjected to female genital mutilation. UNFPA has been part of breaking the silence around this culture tradition. This is something that also has resonance in certain countries in the Pacific as well. And Cultural norms are traveling with individuals across borders. So it's no longer just a question of seeing a practice in Africa or the Middle East. Um, Indonesia at this point numerically has the most women and girls who have undergone FGM because it's such a big population. But also we're seeing in Europe, we're seeing in Latin America, we're seeing in you know, migrant populations here uh, in your country, in Australia, of practices that need to be addressed and interrupted. Right, And this uh, is part of the concern across the region where uh, fertility rates in the preponderance of countries in the Pacific where UNFPA works among teenage girls are actually going up. This suggests that access to information and access to services is not reaching a young population non-judgmental, youth-friendly, accessible services. Very, very key. Uh, when we think about a place like Samoa, the Federated States of Micronesia, Vanuatu, Kibat, uh, Tonga, Nauru, and the Solomon Islands, and Tuvalu, these are places where married women would like to avoid pregnancy, but they're not using modern contraception. Again, their rights and choices, we don't have it available and at the ready. It's partly a logistical problem, it's partly a cost problem, but a lot of it is also our mindset and the ability of a woman to exercise her power to do what she wants of her own volition. In these beautiful Pacific Island countries, contraceptive prevalence rates have been static, below 30%. Whereas in most developing countries, they're really more in the 60 to 70% of women who can use contraception that want. It's less than half in most of the Pacific. Earlier this year, uh, as we released our report, we had to admit that the vision of Cairo, it's not a reality for all. If the SDGs say leave no one behind, part of the sustainable development goals is to redouble efforts to make sure that we finish the unfinished business by 2030 
which is the deadline that uh, countries now have set for achieving sustainable development. Despite our best efforts, we have to admit that we can do better and we should do better for women and girls. And that involves all of us and we all have a role to play. And maybe we can discuss that a little more later. For UNFPA, we have codified this in three zeros that we hope are easy to describe and maybe more direct because we wanna work directly with communities. So of our three zeros by the year 2030, the first one, is zero unmet need for contraception. And I've explained that this also has social repercussions. If a woman is pregnant too often and cannot keep her job, if she cannot create a job, because in some countries this is what she's gonna to have to do. And in fact, most parents do want to invest in each individual child. The zero unmet need for contraception has been proven by very solid, uh, sophisticated research published in The Lancet to show that the return on investment of contraception, of investing in adolescent girls is at least 10 times and can be even 200 times um, what the health system spends. Um, the second zero is to end preventable deaths during pregnancy and childbirth. And the third, of course, is to end gender-based violence. Zero gender-based violence, including practices like child marriage and female genital mutilation, all of these have to be based on high quality data. So meeting statisticians here, talking about the power of describing who is being left behind. Not an average, which is going to disguise the person who has nothing to worry about, right? From the one who is at the other extreme. So when we think about high quality population data and 2020 will be a big census year, it's going to help us to achieve these three zeros by ending invisibility. It was so interesting that when the era of the Sustainable Development Goals was launched, the first stop that the United Nations just decided on was in Nauru to prove the point. At the time, it was uh, one of the more isolated places on the globe to show that that population should not be left behind. And this is the principle that gives us the fervor and the passion to achieve success in ending the unfinished business. So we work hard to address inequality. Different population groups, and depending on who you are and where you are, face discrimination around the world. And even though this varies across countries, discrimination against women is universal. So half the population is at a disadvantage from the moment of birth. So let us do whatever it takes to finish that unfinished business of gender equality. Earlier this year, uh, the UN Women Group published on gender equality and inclusive growth, and they surveyed 40 countries. And they also saw the track of being female with poverty, because being poorer, having an income less than half the, the, the median, was heavily female. But you know, I always, in speaking with young people, it's a big part of the work that we do, emphasize that gender equality is for everybody. It's better for men, it's better for women. And we're not trying to turn women into uh, a life that is more like a man's. We're trying to transform the lives of both women and men. So both participate equally. So both are respected. So both are paid equally. <laughs> and that everybody has their own free time and the ability to parent equally as well. Very important for fathers to be respected as they try to play their family roles. In Tonga, we learned a proverb. It says, fangota kihe kato ava, with apologies. Um, it means fishing with a bag that has holes in it, right? And it's telling us that we've got to work in multiple ways and multiple levels. And that we have to understand that um, whether it's a school, a community, the media, this is a big part of young people's lives, um, civil society, and especially uh, male attitudes. Young men are actually very positive in terms of turning that gender equality uh, tide, if you will, and women's ability to exercise their rights. So we're meeting women and girls on the sports field. We're advocating for menstruation supplies 
so that girls don't miss a quarter of their education. They can play sports any day of the week that they want. Sexual and reproductive health and rights. You know, we're talking about the most intimate areas of life. We have to do this in a respectful way in dialogue with the people that are affected. It's slow and steady work, community after community, but it shouldn't be too slow. We are pressing up against a deadline to make sure that we know that we have to finish unfinished business. Another uh, really interesting point for me, as we surveyed for our report on population this year, we asked women, are you able to decide if you're going to have sex with your partner, if you are able to leave the house to go to the clinic? And uh, guess what? It was not even 60% of women who said yes on all these parameters. So over 40% of women, two out of five women, have to ask father, partner, husband, mother-in-law, whoever it is, just to be able to leave the house. We do have urgent business to do. And focusing out loud on sexual and reproductive health and rights, I think, gives confidence to people who otherwise would be marginalized. When we talk about the unique role of the analysis and use of data, this is a passion that we all have. I've gotten to know demographers and statisticians in a lot of countries who are turning data into action. It's a great way to describe what is going on. And we, uh, for New Zealand, developed a complete web page of results. What are the facts of what we are using, the contributions of this country, to transform lives when it comes to contraceptive access, when it comes to repairs for things like fistula, which is a damage to the uh, birth canal during pregnancy. All of these are ways of making sure that people are visible who otherwise would be invisible. For women with disabilities who are, in some places, up to 10 times more likely to experience sexual violence. These are flagrant human rights violations. So working in this region, we are protecting people like Elisa Peta in Samoa, who was a woman with a physical disability who was sexually assaulted in a hospital. UNFPA worked day, days over time to shift those social norms, to bring people together and to rally around so that this will never happen again. We've also, uh, understood that attitudes and practices are not part of culture. When you're talking about human rights, we cannot use culture as a defense for uh, attacks upon uh, precious women and girls of the communities. And we are partnering with governments, with civil society, with whoever we can find. And the disabilities community is very well organized in this region. So Pacific Disability Forum, the We Decide movement, they will all be joining us in Nairobi in November when we open a conference 25 years after Cairo to insist that this unfinished business needs action. We know what to do, so let's sign up and say how we're going to do this. Evidence and knowledge is very important, but action is what's going to transform the agenda from the paper into the communities. Now, um, on one hand, you have tradition, taboo, rumor, uh, mythologies, but we also have modern rumor mills, if you will. And it's sad for me that a lot of young people are relegated to going to the web and getting very sketchy information um, in quotes about sex and sexuality, because as a world community, we have uh, patronized and talked down to young people who are perfectly capable of making a good decision. So our youth strategy, which we revamped, and we've built it in concert with young people and with our youth envoy of the UN, is titled My Body, My Life, My World, because young people are also very connected. And so as we go into uh, a march to Nairobi from Cairo, where the next 25 years, and it shouldn't be 25 years, it should be 11 years until 2030, we would like to uh, rectify some of this by giving right information at the right time, age appropriate to young people. The backlash on these issues, the politics behind the debates and the lack of acceptance, 
which to me should just be an ordinary fact of life, that women and girls are fully equal, we see it makes a difference in universe, universal health coverage debates. It makes a difference when the Security Council, for example, nations get together to decide what services should be provided for women who are victimized by sexual violence and conflict. It's never easy. And sexual and reproductive health is always like the reason that consensus has to be a struggle. So ultimately, I think for universal health coverage, just last week, we had silence procedures and dramas and waiting and hoping. And in the end, member states did agree that we should stick to the Cairo ICPD program of action agenda. But there was a lot of debate and uh, worry that we would not have a paragraph, which in the end we have had. Number 68 out of the 80, but it's there um, on sexual and reproductive health. And number 69 is on gender equality. So that was also preserved. And that's a very good thing. Young people um, have taught us, uh, and disabled young people of the Pacific actually lectured me, that we are ignoring their sexuality. They're perfectly competent to decide about pleasure and consent if they're equipped to do this. And they said, you know, where are the materials for us? What are you developing that is going to be, you know, conversant with our needs? Yes, I'm in a wheelchair, I'm blind or whatever it is, but I'm a whole human being. So this has been really great as we move forward into Cairo to bring some of them into this discussion and they will represent uh, for themselves. As I'm being signaled that I must wrap up soon, I would just like to leave you with the idea that reaching young people early is so crucial because making that correction later on is so much more difficult, right? And it's better to learn through experience and the knowledge and power rather than through accidents. So if you have someone who has to drop out of school to support her baby, what does this mean for sustainable development goal number one on poverty? And if she is not empowered to be able to take her place in her community, right? Being left behind means that you're ignored, that no one pays attention to you. And so ultimately, we want to provide women and girls, boys and men, with safe spaces, shared spaces for dialogue. Peace is actually something that begins at home and in your heart. It is not something that you can import if you are having a violent situation that you face day after day, and this is the truth. So in closing, I would like to thank you for the forward thinking that uh, includes strengthening legal frameworks in the law, that includes reaching out a helping hand during times of disaster and crisis to countries of the Pacific, and also for looking inward at home, because everyone can contribute to this agenda, even if it means interrupting a pattern of sexism or uh, you know, verbal abuse or something against someone else. At all levels, 25 years on, it is our hope that governments, that NGOs, development institutions, everyone who has come together to craft this kind of understanding will be with us, if not in person symbolically, on November 12th in Nairobi, when the president of Kenya and uh, uh, Denmark, which is co-sponsoring the Nairobi summit with UNFPA. President Kenyatta will open the summit with his commitment, which is against FGM in his country. And this is going to give confidence to every single Kenyan girl to know that she has the right to say no if she does not want to uh, undergo complications from FGM, which, which uh, is prevalent in Kenya. And he will also make a financial commitment to uh, include contraception as a line item in the budget of Kenya. Again, it's a valuable investment in the understanding that part of the financing of this agenda has to be addressed, and some of that needs to be homegrown. So I think President Kenyatta's leadership will be very welcome there. And we need you. UNFPA, the United Nations, the associations that we work with here, in New Zealand, as a health practitioner, as an academician, as a citizen who is interested in the future of uh, your beautiful country, but also of a region that has a precarious circumstance for many 
women and girls, your ability to lift up the human rights agenda makes a difference in the world today. And as we face these issues together, let us work together to protect the gains we've made. Let us keep the handmaid's tale in the fiction aisle because women are not going back. And ultimately, with much reverence and respect, I repeat a resounding Maori saying that I've heard since I've been here. And it sums up our march to Nairobi. E tangata, e tangata, e tangata. What is the most important thing in the world? It is the people. It is the people, it is the people. Together, we can realize a world of rights and choices. Thank you very much. take questions. So we'll run around with the microphones until we go after. Hello. Oh, that's loud. Um, my name is Amanda Jones. I'm a researcher here at the University of Otago, and I, I work in public health specifically. Thank you very much for your talk. It was um, very moving, very inspiring, and admire the work that you're doing. So thank you for that and for your team also. Um, I like your three zeros. Um, and um, so I just want to ask a question around that a little bit. Um, I think it seems like an aspirational goal, but I'm curious about the practical implementation of achieving a zero. Um, I do work also in cost effectiveness work. Yes. <laughs> um, so we, we know that reducing a number is easier for the first part and then to reduce it further and further gets harder and harder to achieve and more and more difficult um, and more expensive. So is the idea that the zeros are to say in no situation, is it okay that these things are happening? Or is it to say, we believe we want to see our indicator is zero? <laughs> well, I'm so happy to address this question. This is a brilliant question because as we uh, use the power of data and analysis, the strategic plan development that we do is in concert with governments uh, who are our board. You know, as United Nations, they mandate what we do. But also, we want it to be very practical. And SDG 17 on partnerships has been a huge advantage for us. We are serious about the zero. What we saw was that we needed to lift our ambition to be able to reach these perfectly attainable goals. And the costing exercise that we're doing um, is something that we will present in Nairobi. I'm very proud that uh, people like Jeffrey Sachs at Columbia University we're working with Victoria uh, University and also uh, University of Washington in Seattle for our first zero ending uh, unmet need for contraception. Unmet need, of course, I can't access something that I need. We do this as a consortium. None of the work that UNFPA does can we do on our own. And again, this is why I'm so excited that, you know, uh, this audience is interested in this topic. The consortium that is actually costing and working on family planning, which I co-chair with the president of the Gates Foundation, Chris Elias, is made up of a multiplicity of sectors, including academics, but also very persuasive uh, people in civil society. And we link to parliamentary committees, because as I was saying in my example with President Kenyatta, the vote has to have domestic resources we know that women will actually pay out of pocket for reproductive health care when they can afford it, right? And so ultimately, when we say zero unmet need, um, we've had to be adept at even redefining how we measure need. Normally, uh, you know, this is like a little technical factoid here, since this is your field, you may know this already. Um, the denominator for unmet need was per married woman. Now here I am in a polygamous relationship. Here I am in a non-married woman relationship that's stable. Or here I am as a teenager who actually is smart enough to know 
that I'm going to be sexually active and I do not wish to become pregnant, right? So for me, it's not even about family planning. It is true contraception. All of these are dimensions of need. When we say leave no one behind, it's actually that very school girl, if she's a university student, for example, whose education gets interrupted, the stigma, the shame, the blame, and then here we go in the cycle of poverty all over again. So we believe that we have a very strong uh, economic case. But of course, everything we do is predicated on rights, on the human rights pillar of the United Nations. Now, uh, for the second one, ending uh, death and childbirth, this is a clear cut win-win, it's less controversial. Although I must say that uh, midwives who save lives are on the front line of so much that's expected of them. But yet and still, we're asking them to be youth-friendly, non-judgmental, and certainly to be welcoming. You know, it can be exasperating as a health practitioner. When someone comes in at the last minute, they haven't had a single visit, you don't know who they are, they're in labor, and you know, it's a panic in the, in the place. So here in the Pacific, what I've been told, and you know, my team is here as well, is that for some countries, death and childbirth isn't even an issue. They have less than 10 childbirths a year in some of the smaller population countries. But then you have one of the countries where the birth rate, the doubling time of the population, is among the top 10 in the world, and that's Papua New Guinea. So there, the risk of uh, death and childbirth zooms. So the costing exercise is actually to be able to explain to a donor like New Zealand and many of our other donors who have stood with us. Unfortunately, we've also been abandoned by a very important donor in recent times. Um, to say that absolutely this is achievable if we prioritize women and girls. You know, uh, similarly for menstruation, we've been challenged. Um, somebody just said to me, well, doc, you know, if we have toilet paper in every toilet stall, menstruation is a biological process. Where's the free menstruation supplies? You know, we've had some disasters around stigma and shame because of girls having accidents with menstruation at school or at work or whatever. Well, this should be catered to. The third zero on ending sexual and gender-based violence now. The Secretary General said to us in line with the Sustainable Development Goals, follow the path of ambition. This is huge in terms of ambition. This is one where I can't confidently say, for the other two, we must get to zero. Gender-based violence, of course, you know, tradition, culture, gender roles, expectations. Again, coming from Latin America, the you know, machismo land, if you will, we have got to engage with each other and have more real relationships. We also have to understand that gender itself is changing. You know, the world is changing. It's not a binary world like it was back in the olden days. So what are we gonna do when people are ridiculed or subjected to otherism, you know, based on sexual diversities, for example? These are new path-breaking you know, ground that we're gonna have to apply the best of our, not just academic knowledge, but the ability to intercede and to dialogue with people who don't agree with us right now. So it's taken a lot of humility for UNFPA to you know, be that bridge and try to work across faiths, across, um, you know, I was in Niger with the traditional chiefs of that country with their regalia, they're magnificent. And they have come onto the record as promoting family planning and an end to child marriage. You know, and this is conservative uh, uh, part of West Africa. So there's a lot to ponder with this. It's not automatic and partnership, I think, is really at the heart of the success. Uh, kia ora. Um, thank you very much and to you and your team for presenting this work. I'm here as a representative from the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Women's Health. And um, I also extend an apology from my fellow department members to say that they would have loved to have been here today. So thank you. Um, I want to reply to everything that you pretty much put into your presentation today. But one, uh, there are two things that I think drive me in my work is the fact that um, New Zealand has one of the highest rates of maternal suicide. And in fact, it's the leading cause of mortality, maternal mortality in New Zealand. Um, 
there is work that's happening in that space. And then also when we come to start talking about reproductive aut um, autonomy, tubal ligation is funded in New Zealand, but vasectomy is not, except in very rare cases. So, I, you know, we still, I wish that we could do one of these for New Zealand around women's rights and autonomy. Um, anyway, but thank you. Well, thank you so much for um, that elucidative comment. I think, again, gender inequality has to be looked at in its totality. And uh, it is an extremely distressing statistic about maternal suicide. I believe that uh, postpartum depression is so underdiagnosed and it's hard for, again, uh, people to speak about this because of the stigma that's attached to not bonding you know, immediately with, uh, with, with the newborn. Ultimately, um, you know, I'm looking for ways of learning how you're doing it here in the sense of uh, taboo and culture. I think it's an exciting time to try to rupture some of these um, negative consequences from the silence that surrounds some of these practices. And mental health, you know, writ large is one of those issues. But I certainly think that uh, providing uh, care to people postpartum is, is one of the aspirations that we share. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm a registered nurse here at the hospital and I was just wondering, we're having a abortion law reform in New Zealand. If you have any ideas or tips on how we could make it so that we have a good, you know, abortion law that makes it safe and easy to access for everybody. Well, thanks for the question. And we have um, understood that New Zealand as part of your democratic process are actually uh, examining this issue. And um, as United Nations, we don't comment on internal legislation specific to any country. So um, I will just say generically, not about New Zealand, but in general, that um, abortion is one of the most polarizing and divisive issues, which again, we hope that evidence and an understanding of the consequences of unsafe abortion would be understood because it is a big contributor to that second zero of ending uh, preventable maternal death. Now, uh, the fact is that uh, from many parameters, UNFPA uh, is bound by ethics to work within the laws of particular countries. But we uh, also have to bring uh, truth and evidence into the discussion. So for example, we know that there are gaps in data because the doctor or the midwife is not going to put botched abortion as the cause of death on many certificates if it's against the law, right? But hemorrhage, if you will, um, is a preponderant cause of death during pregnancy and childbirth. We've also seen that uh, in places where abortion is not legal, the recourse to unsafe abortion has led to uh, you know, drastic consequences, especially for young people. Even where abortion is legal, I think the dialogue and the ability to discuss this in a way um, which I think you know, many countries are trying to find a way, uh, our insistence is that where services are legal, that they should be quality services, and again, accessible within the laws of the country. This debate, along with the debate on LGBTIQ issues and on uh, what you call here relationship and sexuality education, which I think is a better term. We use comprehensive sexuality education in the manuals that we build on life skills. Um, there's still controversy over the spoiled innocence of girls who are pregnant right now, are being coerced right now. And we walk that line, um, as I said earlier, of working with society. Religion and faith, very important to that girl, to her family, to her community. So we wanna have that dialogue. Similarly, um, for legislation, we're having a push as part of the zeros to declare 18 the uh, age of marriage and consent. 
you know, if you're 14, let's face it, you know, you, you, you may not really be expressing gender equality uh, in a marriage. So ultimately, working with places like Al Azhar in Cairo, Egypt, it's the leading authority on the Islamic rules. Just this year, a fatwa was issued against marriage before the age of 18. So that's very salutary, of course, this is what it says in the big book, but community by community now, our teams of UNFPA working with others have to put this in practice. I understood today, for example, that age of consent is another issue that New Zealand uh, has been looking at for marriage. So what I will say is that the example of a democratic society where you can have uh, these discussions in the public sphere and legitimize the uh, ability to bring evidence to the table makes a world of difference. And so this is part and parcel of what we try to do uh, in our work. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. The living wage movement uh, is part of the decent work uh, sustainable development goal. And uh, what we've understood very clearly, and in fact, a lot of the work that UNFPA has done over the 50 years found its way into the sustainable development goals, is that everything is a package that goes together. So rights and choices in this day and age are very much bound up in do you have certain types of resources? I would say education is probably the one that we have the most anxiety about because if you can read and write, maybe you can maneuver yourself out of poverty in a way that someone who's not educated, you know, and as we track things like maternal mortality, um, age at marriage, et cetera, et cetera, poverty hand in hand, the country with the highest fertility rate in the world, average fertility, seven children per woman. This is Niger. The, and you know, I mentioned I was with the traditional chiefs there earlier this year. Highest illiteracy, big maternal death, you know, it, it all goes together. So ultimately for us, um, working with the International Labor Organization, ILO, very important because again, for young people, uh, being able to contribute to your society, to be a respected member of your community, you know, uh, you're, identity in terms of uh, your job, whether you're, you know, doing fishing or something more formal, it doesn't really matter. You, that's part of the fabric of social identity. So we do see the decent work aspect as very important. Another one of the SDGs that UNFPA has been very vociferous about is the ones that have to do with environment and climate change, you know, life on land, uh, life underwater. Very, very important to understand that women are going to be the prime, uh, you know, vulnerable people. If it's a cyclone, if it's a war, you name whatever the calamity is, we've got to plan to protect women and girls. And so part of the decent work aspect is the dignity of the human being. And for us, we actually label our contribution in crisis dignity kits. So we provide, and they're pre-positioned here in the region, uh, menstrual supplies, the toothbrush, the soap, the blanket, the whatever it is that the, uh, uh, the delivery kit, you know, so that safe delivery can happen, even in the middle of what's going on in Hurricane Dorian. We've had to figure out how are we going to supply these things. So again, you know, I think the challenge is partly science and logistics, but a lot of it is the human concern that everybody should have the right to work a decent job, decent hours, hopefully with parental leave built in there. And so we have been strong advocates on that aspect of gender equality. I'd just like to mention briefly that we opened an office on aging, understanding that uh, a living wage early in your life is protective in older age. Early, I, earlier, I gave a statistic about women below the poverty line. Well, for older women who never had the pension, uh, if they were partnered, they don't necessarily benefit. Um, and there are uh, two 
first evers for our time. Well, we have the biggest population ever. I mean, it's 7.7 .7 billion at this point. And rapidly increasing, may I mention, zero number one, an unmet need for contraception. But the uh, numbers of young people in the world population are unprecedented, 1.8 billion, right? So that's really huge. We've also recognized that one in seven people is likely to live with a disability. So that recognition, including mental health disability, I mean, we've got our work cut out for us. But it's also a time when we have the most people over age 60. So the elderly population is huge. And the feminization of poverty in that age group, right, is partly because of this disparity in pay and unpaid work, actually, in earlier times. So our Office on Aging, which also looks at countries with low fertility, and also at uh, issues of sex selection bias. As we have advanced technology, it's great, especially for infertility. You know, we can do so much more now. But uh, as the sex of the fetus can be determined, the preference for boys has really skewed whole populations, uh, many of them in Asia. And so we're working with those governments and those countries to see what we can do to uh, ensure that this does not become a, a, a feature of a future society. So just again, to thank everyone, Maddie, thank you for welcoming me. Uh, it's great to be here at Otago. And I'm really so pleased that um, as we think about the next 25 years and the next 50 years, we can imagine a world of a possibility where in fact, women and girls will be at the center where we will factor in the benefits of gender equality for the whole society. And certainly discrimination, stigma, um, leaving people behind, hopefully will be a thing of the past. Thank you so much again, much appreciated.